Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number three, titled The Lord Reigns, ready for teaching on January 20. It's from the Sabbath School lesson series, Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Santrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 13. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Psalms that we're studying about this quarter. We thank you that in these Psalms we find so much about you and your relationship to us, but also to people in the past who have loved you regardless of the things that happened in their lives, that have followed you and worshipped you and put these Psalms together so that we can see more clearly your love and your graciousness. Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray that we may see Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. And today I'd like to pray for those who've asked for prayer, Lystra Brake, uh, Hope Bennett in Canada, Milka Universe, and Marilyn and Michael Marshall, with Michael having a problem with his sight. Lord, I pray that for those who are having difficulty with seeing and reading, that, that these lessons may be a blessing to them as I read the Sabbath School pamphlet lesson by lesson. Lord, may your name be glorified in what we do today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is Psalm 93 and verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Let's read that again. Psalm 93 verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. The Psalms unswervingly uphold the foundational belief in God's sovereign reign. The Lord created and sustains everything that he had created. He is the sovereign king over the whole world, and he rules the world with justice and righteousness. His laws and statutes are good and bring life to those who keep them. The Lord is a just judge who ensures that the world remains well-ordered, and he does so by rewarding the righteous and punishing the wicked, but in his time, not ours. God's covenant with Israel plays a special role in securing the world because it heralds the Lord's salvation. The Lord adopted Israel as his prized possession, making Israel of all the nations his people. The Lord is faithful to his covenant and continues to care for his flock despite their unfaithfulness and at times open rebellion. The Lord's sovereign rule thus renders the world firmly established and secure. The psalmists want the reader to understand this foundational truth. With this worldview as their lighthouse, the psalmists seek to thrive and to serve God with undivided devotion. Sunday, January 14. The Lord has made us. Read Psalm 8 and Psalm 100. How are God and people portrayed in these psalms? What do these psalms reveal about God's character? Psalm 8 reads, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. 
O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And then Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Creation plays a crucial role in the Psalms. In upholding God's sovereignty, the heavens, which are his handiwork, proclaim his glory and power. As you read in Psalm 19, 1-4, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork, day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun and Psalm 97, verse 6, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. God's name is majestic in all the earth. We read in Psalm 8, verses 1 and verse 9, the Lord has created everything. He has no beginning. As you read in Psalm 93, verse 2, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting and no end we read in psalm 102 25 to 27 of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands they will perish but you will endure yes they will all grow old like a garment like a cloak you will change them and they will be changed but you are the same and your years will have no end he is everlasting and superior over the gods of the nations, which, as it says in Psalm 115, verse 4, are only the work of men's hands, nothing more. The idols have hands, but they handle not, we read in Psalm 115, 7. As for the Lord, it says in Psalm 95, 4 and 5, in his hands are the deep places of the earth, and his hands formed the dry land. Several psalms portray God's power over the forces in nature that other nations believe to be divine, as in Psalm 29, Psalm 93 and Psalm 104. These psalms reassert the claim that the Lord reigns over all creation and is supreme in power and dignity. Psalm 100 verse 3 strikes one subtle form of idolatry, self-reliance, stressing that God has made us and not we ourselves. Creation also testifies to God's love. Everything that exists owes its existence to God, who also sustains life, as we read in Psalm 95 and verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. And Psalm 147, verses 4 to 9, he counts the number of the stars, he calls them all by name, great is our Lord and mighty in power, he is understanding, is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble, he casts the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains, he gives to the beast its food, and to the young ravens that cry. Notice that God not only granted people existence, but that he also made ancient Israel his people and the sheep of his pasture, as we read in Psalm 100 verse 3. The notion of his people and his sheep reveals God's desire for a close relationship with his people. Only the Creator has the power to bless and cause his people to increase, and thus he is the only one worthy of their worship and trust.
Numerous psalms call everything that has breath, all the sea, the earth, and everything in it, to shout for joy before the Lord. The glory of God is seen in the creation, even in the fallen earthly creation, and the psalms points us to God alone as worthy of worship. And so to finish the day, Psalm 8 verse 4 reads, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? What is your response to God as your creator? When God calls the stars by their names, in Psalm 147 verse 4, how much more do you think God cares for you? Monday, January 15, The Lord Reigns Closely tied, in fact inseparably tied, to the Lord as Creator is the Lord as Sovereign, as Ruler. The declaration, The Lord Reigneth, is solemnly proclaimed in Psalm 93 verse 1, and that reads, The Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed, he has girded himself with strength, surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. And in Psalm 96 verse 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established, it shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. And Psalm 97 verse 1, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad. And Psalm 99 verse 1, the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble, he dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. But its echoes are heard throughout the book of Psalms. The Lord is clothed with honour, majesty and strength, as we read in Psalm 93, 1, and Psalm 104, verse 1 also says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, you are very great, clothed with honour and majesty. He is surrounded with clouds and darkness. We read in Psalm 97 too, clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. But also covers himself with light as with a garment, as we read in Psalm 104 verse 2. Who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. These metaphors exalt the king's power and splendour and are carefully chosen to express God's unique greatness, which is beyond human comprehension. Read Psalm 97. What characterises the Lord's reign? Well, let's try this. Psalm 97, beginning at verse 1. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. His lightnings light the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad. And the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. So, in Psalm 97 verse 2, what characterises the Lord's reign? Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. And verse 10, you who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. And what is the domain of his reign? Verse 1, 
The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice for the multitude of isles. Let the multitude of isles be glad. And verse 5, the mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. And 9, for you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The Lord's rule is demonstrated in his works of creation in Psalm 96 verse 5, For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens his salvation. And Psalm 98 verse 2, The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. And a judgment in Psalm 96 verse 10, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns, the world also is firmly established, it shall not be moved, he shall judge the peoples righteously. The Lord establishes his kingdom over the whole world, as expressed in Psalm 47, verses 6 to 9. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together, the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, unparalleled in power and majesty, as we read in Psalm 45, 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And Psalm 93, verses 1 and 10. The Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed, he has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. And Psalm 103 verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. The Lord's reign is established on mercy, justice and righteousness, and it brings order and stability to the created world. As we read in Psalm 98 verse 3, He has remembered His mercy and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And Psalm 99 verse 4, The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. God's reign unites both heavenly and earthly worshippers in the praise of God. As we read in Psalm 103, verses 20 to 22, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And Psalm 148, and that reads, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He also established them for ever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. 
Many Psalms envision all humanity acknowledging God's sovereign rule, as we read in Psalm 96, verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. And Psalm 97, verse 1, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. And Psalm 99, verse 1, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. And Psalm 145, verses 11 to 13, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. But not all people or even earthly rulers do at least for now. The Lord's reign is constantly defied by the wicked who deny and mock the Lord and oppress his people, as you read in Psalm 14 and verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. And Psalm 74, verses 3 to 22. Lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees. And now they break down its carved work all at once with hammers and axes. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, Let us destroy them altogether. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. O oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave them as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness." You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. The day is yours. The night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. O, oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty, and do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Though Challenged by the prosperity of some wicked people and troubled by God's forbearance, the psalmist trusts in God's sovereign rule and continues to flourish in the assurance of God's righteous judgments. As we read in Psalm 68 verse 21, But God will wound the head of his enemies, the hairy scalp of the one who still goes on in his trespasses. And in Psalm 73 verses 17 to 20, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors, as a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. By faith, 
God's people rejoice in the inauguration of God's kingdom through Christ's redeeming ministry and wait for the consummation of the kingdom at Christ's second coming, as you read in Matthew 12, 26 and onwards. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Baalzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges." But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 28. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says, all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And so to finish today, Psalm 97 verse 10 reads, You who love the Lord hate evil. Why should our love for God cause us to hate evil? And how are these two concepts related? Tuesday, January 16, God is the Judge. Read Psalm 75, Why is the boasting of the wicked in vain? Psalm 75, beginning at verse 1, We give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks, for your wondrous works declare that your name is near. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. Salah. I said to the boastful, Do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, Do not lift up the horn, do not lift up your horn on high, do not speak with a stiff neck. For exultation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth train and drink down. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. As the sovereign king, the Lord is also a lawgiver. As we read in Psalm 99, 7, he spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance he gave them. And a judge in Psalm 98 verse 9, before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he will judge the world and the peoples with equity. And as we read in Psalm 97 too, clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. The wicked constantly threaten the just order that God established in the world. But the Lord will judge the world and bring the rule of evil to its end. As we read in verses 8 to 10 of Psalm 75, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup and the wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down, but I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. And Psalm 96 and verse 13 before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. 
In Psalm 75, several images depict the irrevocable destruction of the wicked. The image of a cup with red wine in verse 8 conveys the intensity of God's fury, as expressed in Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And Revelation 14, verse 10, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Cutting off the horns of the wicked depicts the end of their power and dominion, while the horns of the righteous shall be exalted, as we read in Psalm 75.10, All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. God chooses a proper time in verse 2, or an appointed time for his judgment. This executive judgment clearly will take place at the end of time, as we read in Psalm 96, verse 13. But it's also referred to in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 to 26. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The Lord probes people's hearts as part of his judgment. As we read in Psalm 14 verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. It is reminiscent of Genesis 6, verses 5 and 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Both texts show that the execution of God's judgment over the world is preceded by God's examination of the people's lives and seeking whomever he can save. This judgment is sometimes called the investigative judgment, when God defends the righteous and decides the fate of the wicked. How does it work? First, God delivers his people from the wicked, as we read in Psalm 97.10, You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. And verse 9 of 146, The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down and crowns the humble with salvation, as you read in 149 verse 4. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Second, the unrepentant wicked are destroyed forever, as you read in Psalm 97 and verse 3. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. Some psalms poetically describe the uselessness of human weapons against the divine judge, such as Psalm 76, verses 3 to 6. There he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield and sword of battle, Selah. You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted were plundered. They have sunk into their sleep, and none of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a dead sleep. The Lord is also a forgiving God, although he punishes people's misdeeds, as we read in Psalm 99, verse 8. You answered them, O Lord our God, you were to them God who forgives, though you took vengeance on their deeds. 
God's people, not only the wicked, shall give an account to God. As you read in Psalm 50 verse 4, He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And Psalm 135 verse 14, For the Lord will judge his people and he will have compassion on his servants. The Psalms convey the same notion that is expressed in other biblical texts, that God's judgment begins with God's people and is extended to the whole earth. As we read in Deuteronomy 32, 36, For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is no one remaining bond or free. And 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? The psalmist cries to God to judge him, but relies on God's righteousness to defend him. As you read in Psalm 7, 8 to 11, The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. My defence is of God, who saves the upright and heart. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. And Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The Psalms call us to rejoice in anticipation of God's judgments, as you read in Psalm 67, verse 4. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Selah. And Psalm 96, verses 10 to 13. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth, and Psalm 98, verses 4 to 9. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. And so to finish today, how is God's judgment good news for those covered by the blood of Christ? Wednesday, January 17, Ever Mindful of His Covenant the theme of God's judgment prompts a significant question. How can God's people have peace with God and assurance of salvation at the time of judgment? Psalm 94 verse 14, For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. And Psalm 105 verses 7 to 10, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting lasting covenant and daniel 7:22 until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the most high and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom 
God's people are secure because the Lord placed his dwelling place in Zion. As you read in Psalm 76, verses 1 and 2, In Judah God is known, his name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion, and established his everlasting covenant with them as his treasured possession. As we read in Psalm 94, 14, For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. And Psalm 105, verses 8 to 10, He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. God does not simply promise not to reject his covenant people. He actively works to keep them secure in him. He forgives their sins, as we read in Psalm 103 and verse 3, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. He instructs, blesses and strengthens his people. As you read in Psalm 25, verses 8 to 11, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. And Psalm 29 and verse 11, the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And Psalm 105 verse 24, he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. God's judgments are given to turn the people to righteousness and to demonstrate that God cares for them. As you read in Psalm 94 verses 8 to 15. Understand, you senseless among the people and you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge. The Lord knows the thoughts of man that they are futile. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law, that you may give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment will return to righteousness, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Psalm 105 as a whole shows the Lord's faithfulness to his covenant in Israel's history. In everything that happened, the good and the bad, God was there. He providentially led Joseph to Egypt and through him saved his people and the nations in that area during the severe famine, as you read in Psalm 105, 16 to 24. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. Israel also came into Egypt and Jacob dwelt in the land of Ham. He increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. The Lord raised Moses to lead his people out of Egyptian slavery, which he did with signs and wonders on their behalf. As you read in Psalm 105, verses 25 to 38, he turned their heart to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made it dark, and they did not rebel against his word. He turned their waters into blood and killed their fish. Their land abounded with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and lice in all their territory. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. He struck their vines also and their fir tree, fig trees and splitted the trees of their territory.' 
He spoke, and locusts came, young locusts without number, and ate up all the vegetation in their land, and devoured the fruit of their ground. He also destroyed all the firstborn in their land, the first of all their strength. He also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them." The Lord granted his people the promised land, as we read in Psalm 105, verse 11, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. And verse 44, he gave them the lands of the Gentiles and they inherited the labor of the nations. And his continual protection, verses 12 to 15, When they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. He multiplied them, as you read in verse 24. He increased his people greatly, and made them stronger than their enemies. He freed them from their overlords in verses 37 and 38. And he also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them and provided for their daily needs. As you read in verses 39 to 41, he spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. The people asked, and he brought quail, and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It ran in the dry places like a river. The Lord is undoubtedly in sovereign control of all that involves his people, a truth that the psalmist wanted his people never to forget. When God remembers his covenant, it involves more than cognizance or memory because it always leads to action, as we'll see in the following verses. Genesis 8 verse 1, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. And 1 Samuel 1 verse 19, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to the house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And Psalm 98 verse 3, He has remembered remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And Psalm 105 verses 42 to 44, For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. He brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles, and they inherited the labor of the nations." Likewise, when the people are called to remember God's wonders and judgment, it means that the people should live in ways that honour God. In this covenant, Israel's primary calling is to remain faithful to the covenant by observing God's laws, as you read in Psalm 78 verses 5 to 7, for he established the testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And Psalm 105 verse 45 that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws, praise the Lord. God's people also are called to bear witness about God to other nations because the Lord wishes all nations to join his people Israel, as we read at the beginning of Psalm 105, verses 1 and 2. O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works." 
The world is thus secure in the protective covenant of the Almighty and the merciful God, as we read in Psalm 89, verses 28 to 34. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow his faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. And so to finish the day, what do we have in Jesus which shows why these promises made to ancient Israel can now apply to us? We find that in Galatians 3, verses 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. Thursday, January 18, your testimonies are very sure. Read Psalm 19, 7, 93, 5, 119, 165, Psalm 1, verses 2 and 6, Psalm 18, verse 30, and Psalm 25, verse 10. What common thread runs through them all? Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And Psalm 93, verse 5, your your testimonies are very sure. Holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. And verse 165 of 119. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. And Psalm 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And verse 6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And Psalm 18 and verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. And Psalm 25 verse 10, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. The Lord's supremacy in the world as the sovereign creator, king and judge has theological implications for the reliability of his testimonies. The testimonies, the Hebrew word edot, e-d-u-t, or decree or law, refer to the body of laws and ordinances with which the Lord governs the religious and social life of his people, as expressed in Exodus 32 verse 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other. They were written. They are very sure. We read in verse 93, verse 5, Your testimonies are very sure. Holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever, reflecting the stability and permanence of God's throne and the world that God created and sustains. As we read in Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2, The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established, so it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The Hebrew word translated as sure, the English word amen derives from this word, conveys the notion of reliability, faithfulness and firmness. As we read in Second Samuel 7 and verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established 
forever and first chronicles seventeen twenty three and now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established for ever, and do as you have said. God's laws are unchangeable and indestructible. God vouches for the integrity of his promises and commands. God's faithfulness is both wholly reassuring in guaranteeing the unchangeable character of his rule and wholly demanding in asking the people's responses of trust and obedience to God. At the same time, the lack of justice in the world is poetically described as a shaking of earth's foundations. In Psalm 18 verse 7, Then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. And Isaiah 24 verses 18 to 21, And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. God's law instructs the people in the way of righteous life that can withstand God's judgment. The righteous, thus, shall not be shaken because they are firmly rooted in his law which provides stability and security, and their hearts are steadfast. The Hebrew word kun, k-u-n, also means be firm, be secure in the Lord. As we read in Psalm 112, verse 1, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. And verses 6 and 7, Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Nothing causes those who keep God's law to stumble. We read in Psalm 119, well, we did read in Psalm 119, verse 165, which signifies God's protection and guidance in life. And we read that in Psalm 1, verses 2, 3, and 6. God's word is depicted as the lamp to the psalmist's feet, and so it protects him from the enemy's hidden snares. As you read in Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And verse 110, The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Great peace, which is enjoyed by those who love God's law, as expressed in verse 165, great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble, obviously does not result from a total absence of trials, as you read in verse 161. Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. It rather derives from abiding in God's presence and having a wholesome relationship with Him. And so, to finish the day, what are practical ways that keeping God's laws and rules and testimonies have helped you in your life? On the other hand, what have you suffered from violating them? Friday, January 19, Further Thought Read Psalm 86, verses 5 and 15, and Ellen White's God's Love for Man, pages 9 to 15, in Steps to Christ, if you have the opportunity. But we have here the opportunity of reading Psalm 86, verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. And verse 15, but you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. 
How does the truth that God is love help us better understand the various descriptions of God and his deeds in the Psalms? This week's study focuses on some key descriptions of God and his activities, which establish the world and render it firm and secure. The psalmist appealed to God, who is the creator, king, judge, covenantal saviour and lawgiver. The roles in the world that God occupies are further reflected in God's various other names and titles, including shepherd in Psalm 23 verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and in Psalm 80 verse 1, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth, The rock of salvation, as we read in Psalm 95, verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. And Father, in 68, verse 5, A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. And also, Father, in Psalm 89, verse 26, he shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. In the world, we can be secure and safe even amid the turmoil of the great controversy because God is sovereign and faithful in all he does and says. Although these theological themes are by no means exhaustive, they are suggestive of the various ways in which God reveals himself in the Psalms. As we continue to study the Psalms, it is important to remember to read the Psalms in the light of God's character of love and grace and his plan to save and restore the world. The more we study the divine character in the light of the cross, we read in Steps to Christ, page 15, the more we see mercy, tenderness and forgiveness blended with equity and justice, and the more clearly we discern innumerable evidences of a love that is infinite and a tender pity surpassing a mother's yearning sympathy for her wayward child, end of quote. In the Psalms, even when the people face God's judgment for their rebellion, they continue to call upon God because they know that God's anger is only for a time. But his mercy is everlasting, we read in Psalm 103 and verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, why is understanding the reality and prevalence of the great controversy crucial in helping us understand that despite God's ultimate rulership and sovereignty, there is still much turmoil and suffering in our world? Why is the great controversy motif so helpful to us? And two, how should the belief in God as creator shape our understanding of ourselves and our relationship with the rest of creation? What happens when the people stray from that truth? Well, there are some clues in Psalm 106, verses 35 to 42. But they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood. The blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the land, were polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people so that he abhorred his own inheritance and he gave them into the hand of the Gentiles and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their hand. And question three, what was wrong with the idols of the nations in biblical times? Psalm 115 verses 4 to 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not work. Nor do they mutter through their throat. 
Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. What are modern idols? Why are they just as dangerous to our walk with the Lord? And four, how should God's people live knowing that God's judgment begins with his people? How does God judge his people and to what end? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. I Fought and Won by Andrew McChesney Pedro was shocked at the greeting that he got when he returned from church services in Mozambique. Don't go back to the Seventh-day Adventist church, his sister said. It's not a good church because it has false prophets. If you go again, you can't live here anymore. Worrisome thoughts filled Pedro's head. Family problems in his hometown, Berea, had forced him to move 700 miles, that's 1,140 kilometres, to his sister's house in Mozambique capital, Maputo. Because he was new to town, he had missed a few worship services as he searched for an Adventist church. Now he found a church, worshipped there for the first time and returned home to find that his sister didn't want him to go again. Pedro prayed and kept going to church. His sister stopped sharing her food with Pedro. She hoped that hunger would cause him to change his mind. But church members gave him food to eat. Pedro thanked God for his care and kept going to church. One Sabbath morning, as he was preparing to leave for church, his sister told him not to return. Are you still refusing to listen and insisting on going to your church? she asked. You don't want to live here any more because you don't want to comply with the house rules. Pedro was sad but not discouraged. He realised that he wasn't caught in a conflict with his sister, but in a spiritual struggle between Jesus and Satan. He, remem- he remembered Paul's words in Ephesians 6.12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, as quoted in the New King James Version. He went to church and asked the pastor and church members to pray for him. When he returned home later that day, he was kicked out. A friend allowed Pedro to stay with him for two nights. Then a church member gave Pedro a job as the caretaker of his house in exchange for room and board. Today, Pedro still works as a house caretaker. He is free to worship God every Sabbath and he believes that God is working on his sister's heart. Their friendship has been restored and she no longer insists that he stop going to church on Sabbath. Pedro hopes that one day she will accept the whole Bible truth and learn to appreciate the inspired writings of Ellen White. I put on the armour of God, he said. I fought and won and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me as quoted from Philippians 4.13. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the good news of Jesus' soon coming in Africa and around the world. <laughs> 